Exodus, a Christmas story. And uh, I know what you're saying. You're like, Exodus? That's not a Christmas story. That's not, there's, no, there's no woman on a donkey who's pregnant going to Bethlehem, right? There's no pl- at point in the Exodus story where, where a very pregnant lady is knocking at indoors being rejected, right? That's, these are key passages in the Christmas story, and they're just not in the Exodus, right? Uh, you'd be right about that. But, uh, but what we see in Matthew's Gospel, you know, Matthew... It's that he mirrors the Exodus story. And I have, you know, we got this photograph of Matthew here, and Matthew's ringing a bell in the beginning in his Christmas story. He's ringing a bell, and that bell is saying, Hey, remember the last time God saved his people? It's happening again. Remember how he took them out of Egypt? It's happening again. And today is the big one. Today is the is the huge one. Like this is, this is where this idea came from, our scriptures today in this sermon, and I'm really excited to, uh, to tell you about it. And it's kind of a big idea, and I hope that you can grasp it, right? So today we're going to be putting on our biblical glasses, and we're going to be understanding what, what, what is meant by Jesus' birth, how, what Matthew is telling us. So to begin it here, we need to start with part of our reading, which begins with verse 13. Now when the wise men, you know, the magi, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and says, rise, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child and to destroy him. And he rose and he took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remain there until the death of Herod, this was to fulfill the word that has been spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. What does that sound like? Does that sound like anything in particular? When I read this, what I hear is Passover. I hear Passover being talked about here. You guys are familiar with Passover, right? Like so... So God, just to kind of recap where we are, God calls Moses at this burning bush, says, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let your people go. And Moses goes there, says, let my people go. And Pharaoh goes, no, I will not let your people go. And, and then all these plagues come across Pharaoh and, and Egypt, right? All these plagues of flies and gnats and all these different things. And we get to the last one. And the last one is a doozy. It's a real doozy. And it's uh, that the angel of death is going to go over all of Egypt. And it's, and it's going to kill all the firstborns unless you put the blood of the lamb on your doorposts. Unless you do that, then the angel of death is going to come over you, right? Like that's like this is the heart of Passover, and it, and it happened. It happened like it's the the people they put it over, and the angel of death went and killed all these firstborn. It said not one house in Egypt was not affected by death. That's a lot. That's a lot. And 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 Pharaoh was like. Ah, oh, I just can't handle it anymore. Get out of here and rush. Get out. Like, get, leave my presence. If you stay here, we're all going to die. And they had to leave so fast that they couldn't even let the bread rise. So they have the tradition of unleavened bread, a, a tradition that we still hold on to, that we still kind of celebrate with the way we practice communion here. Like this, that this, this whole idea and then God's people were thrust into there and they, they were up against the Red Sea and God parted the Red Sea so they went through the waters of the Red Sea and then out on the other side and they wandered the wilderness for 40 years as they became more and more of God's people and they are defined by this idea of Passover. And there's that one phrase in there that says, out of Egypt, I have called my sons. And that's what Matthew is quoting. So after the Magi come, it's 
they, they kind of trick, they trick Herod, have him go out a different way. And Herod gets super angry, and the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, tells Joseph, hey, get out of here, get out of here. Go to Egypt and fulfill what the prophet says, out of Egypt I have called my son. And I think we kind of look at this little verse that says, out of Egypt I call my son, we're like, oh, that's so, that's so sweet. More Jesus fulfilling prophecy, right? More Jesus fulfilling prophecy. Such a, such a nice, it warms your heart kind of verse, right? That's what that text is about, how God rescues us, right? Where is this from? Where is he quoting from it, right? Where? Does anyone know? Out of Egypt I've called my son. No, that's not Psalms. Does anyone know? Uh, not Isaiah either. It's from Hosea. Oh, does anyone remember? When, that was one of the books we went over over the summer in the minor leagues. Does anyone remember what Hosea's big thing was his wife and what was wrong with his wife she was a prostitute and that was meant to say that 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 God told the prophet Hosea hey take a prostitute as your wife because my that's how my people treat me like I have wed myself to them and they just go around to all these other gods that is where we have the phrase, out of Egypt, I have called my son. And what's, it's, it's really interesting. So to understand, before we actually look at what it says in Hosea there, we, we, we gotta look at the people of, the Hebrew people and what they thought, what they, what they th- saw as, as what they were to do with their lives. So in Genesis, you have Father Abraham, right? And Father Abraham gave Abraham a blessing. Father Abraham, God the Father gave Abraham a blessing. And that blessing was you are to be a blessing to the world around you. You are blessed to be a blessing, right? And that goes in and then, and and they go in and they are in, taken into the exodus, they're taken into into Egypt, they're taken into there, and God pulls them out of slavery, pulls them out of a captivity, pulls them out, and makes them his people yet again, and he gives them a certain set of little guidelines. He says, you are not to be like Egypt, because I took you out of Egypt. You are not to take, you're not to have people in captivity. You are not to take slaves. You are not to take advantage of other people. You are not to treat anyone the way Egypt treated you. But what did his people do? They, they, as soon as they got a little bit of power, right? They're like, ooh, slaves would make this easier. They started taking advantage of other people financially, right? They, they, took, they did all these things, and they started going after other gods, too. God said, I am the, uh, I am the, father, the father, the God of your Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one who rescued you out of Egypt. And they still go after all these other people. And we get to Hosea chapter 11. All the way through 10 chapters, and it says this in verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. And the more they were called, the more they went away. And they kept sacrificing to the Baals, to the other gods, and burning offerings to idols. And we can continue to read this and just see what's going out. But out of Egypt, I have called my son. Son, God rescued his people from the exodus, but they just went more and more away. The more he called, the more they went away. It's like that little dog that you guys have that when it gets free out of the house and you call and call and yell and scream and gnash your teeth at the little dog and it just keeps running, right? Yeah, that's 50% of your little dogs. (laughs) <laughs> That's, that is how Israel was to God. <laughs> That's how Israel was to God. 
They just kept running and running away. And that's what is meant by that passage. Out of Egypt I called my son. Because when we put our biblical glasses on, when we put our Bible glasses on and we read it, all of Matthew's original readers, their original hearers of this, they would have remembered, oh, that's what Hosea said. And Hosea wasn't saying it in a positive light. Hmm, well, like that's not good. And, and they would have known what this passage is all about. They would have known that. And this verse is right here. This is what this whole sermon series is all about. This is kind of the, the, the whole big idea in it. Because right here, Matthew is being super clever. He's using, uh, he's using the words, the written words, and the way he's forming the structure to give across a couple of really big ideas, and they're cool, and I'm going to try to convey them to you. Because, what, to be honest with you, like this is one of these ideas that kind of changed my faith. They changed my faith in seeing that it's something so much bigger and grander than anything that I thought before. Because this, this passage, out of Egypt I've called my son, is recognizing that, oh, I've got some issues. Oh, yeah, I mean, we, Hosea is right. We, we've gone off and we did all these things over here. Like, <clears throat> this verse is connecting us to the problem. The problem of Genesis chapter 3, but it's also connecting us to the solution. Because we know that there's a problem, right? We know that there is. We, just like the Hebrews and Hosea knew exactly what he was talking about. He's like, yeah, I get it with the prostitutes. You know, that's, we desperately want someone to show us forgiveness and redemption and grace but as soon as Dan at work messes up on the TPS reports on Friday afternoon before Christmas Eve, there's no grace for Dan, right? None, all right? And we will show him that there's no grace to his face. It's like, my family is coming into town. I need to be home, right? Yet we desperately want to share the meaning of Christmas with everyone, yet when someone wishes us happy holidays at the store, it spools up our anger and makes us a very un-Christmas spirit. Right? Did I step on a toe? I was trying to. <laughs> we are about ourselves. We say keep Christ in Christmas while we bow at the holy altars of Walmart, Target, and Bed Bath and Beyond. Like that's we say these things. And we and we fail to even listen to the revealed voice of God as our Bible app on our phones gets recommended for deletion yet again because we haven't been using it. Those of you with the smartphones know what I'm talking about. I guess I could, for those without, I could go, but your Bible just is collecting more and more dust, right? And you have to blow it off before you can even read it. While we feverishly share and yell at the TV even more, at the latest political takedown. I've not been a blessing. I've been a cynical, angry curse on those around me just like Israel. And we all know we're like this. We feel the need to put more and more and more rules on top of all of this. So like, if I can just obey more of the rules or get a handle on, on that, then I will be okay. But this is why Matthew is so dang clever. Because he's exploiting our knowledge. You're now biblical glasses of Hosea. He's exploiting it so that you can know the real Christmas story. He's exploiting it so that you can know what's going on. It's amazing literature. It really is. Because he says, and Joseph rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was fulfilled what the Lord had spoken 
out of Egypt I have called my son. Who, who's the son there? Who's the son? It's Israel, right? It's all God's people. But who's the son there? It's Jesus. What's happening? Matthew, in this very clever act, is taking all of this and melding it together, the son's life and your lives. He's melding it together and he's saying there's going to be just a little bit of difference. He's melding it there and he's like, hey, you remember how Jesus came? He is the Messiah. He is the embodiment of you, of God's people. He is the embodiment of it all. He's going through and he doesn't just mess up. He, because what happens right after this? Jesus comes out of, out of Egypt, and what, what happens to him? He goes and gets baptized, right? He goes through some water. Who else went through water coming out of Egypt? Exactly. What happened to Jesus right after he went through some water? 40 days in the wilderness? Is this a coincidence? I don't know. But what we see is that, the, that God's people were complaining about, oh, I want Egypt, I want Egypt, as they, before they went through the water. And they were complaining and grumbling and chasing after other idols all the way through the 40 years in the wilderness. But Jesus didn't complain, did he? In fact, he was tempted in every way. And did not fail. Matthew's being clever here in the story. And he's saying that this one, this one that came out of Egypt, the one that came out of Egypt, like you have all come out of Egypt, when you've complained about Dan and his TPS reports, when you've yelled at the checkout lady for saying happy holidays, that when you have failed at not being a blessing to those around you, that his righteousness and holiness is overshadowing it. And that goes all the way to where we see that him, he's constantly being a blessing. He's constantly being a blessing, healing the sick, healing the lame, bringing sight to the blind. He's constantly being a blessing. And he takes us all as Emmanuel, which God with us, all the way to the cross where his death becomes our death. Where all of that Egyptian nature of ourselves gets taken to the cross and is done away with. But he rises again and his life becomes our life. But it's not a life characterized by Egyptians and slavery and bondage, but a life of the kingdom of God where hope is found. This is the story that Matthew is desperately trying to tell. This is the story of what Emmanuel means. That when God is with us, it's not like, oh, he's my co-pilot, my buddy here, going through life with me. It's great. No, that he becomes you and you become him. And his righteousness, his death and his resurrection becomes your righteousness, death and resurrection. That his life becomes your life. The son's life becomes your life. And to the Christian, that's everything. To the Hebrew people, Passover was everything. They celebrate it every year, right? And it's a big thing. To the Christian, Jesus being Emmanuel, God with us, becomes everything to, to us. That because of his death and resurrection, we're like, I don't have to worry. God has me. God loves me, and he is here with me. So the Christmas story, why is it so important to me? It's not because of the sweet and mild Jesus. That's part of it, but that's not why. But it's the story of how God took on all of us, all of our struggles, all of our sin, all of our hurt, and made it so that we are no longer defined by them but we are now defined by his life. 
So as you go forward, go into this life, go shopping, go finish your TPS reports with Dan. While you go off and do all these things, may it be on your lips where you can say, Merry Christmas. But it's not because it's just the Christmas season, but you can say Merry Christmas because God is with us and that His righteousness is our righteousness and His love is our love. Go with God. He is always with you and have peace in His name.